We're preparing to live stream the meeting. Okay. And then we'll just blast this new link. And uh, it's more sort of about documenting the situation. Okay. This is all a performance. It's fine. Exactly. What's the new link so that we can share it? Yes. It is coming in the chat right now. Here is the new link. Maybe. There it is. So. Um, We gotta love technology. This is just the the way that things are now. Um, I I set up this like live stream at the beginning of the week, thinking it would be effortless, and of course it was not. But that's okay. Um, so I'm just gonna change this link in my Instagram profile, and. Oh my goodness. I put I put the new link in my profile thing. Okay. And made an IG story. Wonderful. Mine is not working. <laughs> so oh, that's no. nifty. It's like saying that the the What if you link what if is you, not valid? What if you put it right in there? I took my link tree off because because I was like having a hard time getting in there. So then I just put it put in it took my link tree off. Let me see. Yeah. Let me see. I did the same. Let me see. Yeah, it's definitely going. The link is working. Yeah. Oh, can people can hear us? Yeah. Can you hear us out there? You can hear they can hear our technical Yay! difficulties. Yes, they can hear all of our technical difficulties. <laughs> technical difficulties. Check check. <laughs> So I have the link updated. I'm good to go. Is everyone feeling ready to go now? <laughs> Finally, that we have all of this technical stuff figured out. Lovely. Only 15 minutes late. I think we're doing pretty good. Oh, uh, can you check the, change the co-host thing again? It got like flipped again or something. Yeah, of course. Make co-host. Yes. Thanks. No problem. 
Okay. Um, so hi everyone. Welcome to the uh, Conditions and Possibilities Artist Talk here on this terrible platform called Zoom. Um, thank you for being patient as we worked out our technical difficulties. Um, we're happy that you are here. And I know I'm happy to be here, a um, little exhausted after yesterday, but ready to sort of delve into some of these issues and um, sort of work through some of these really, really big questions with all of these brilliant people. Um, so Conditions and Possibilities is a, I guess, a series of performance festival uh, idea that I have had sort of brewing in my brain space for a while. Um, and it's pretty much like what my work has been about for the last like five years, really. Um, and I was sort of inspired by this quote from the text, um, from this text called The Artist at Work, Proximity of Art and Capitalism um, by Bojana Kunst. And she writes that, quote, art is firmly intertwined with questions concerning the conditions and possibilities of life itself. Art interferes with the disclosure of potential modes of common realities. The new political effect of art could therefore be sought to produce situations from the assumption that the capacity to act is larger than the pre-given institutional means to realize it." Um, end quote. And so often, you know, I feel like, I know personally, and I Feel that this kind of comes up a lot for the people that I interact with, whether they're artists or um, they do other things with their life, is that we feel constrained by the realities of capitalism, this system that we all sort of find ourselves um, inside of. Um, and people get very sort of, I, I guess, you know, the, the term is we're sort of all doomers about this, right? We, we can't like sort of see any sort of future outside of the way that the world is currently organized. Um, and there's a part of me that, that really truly believes that uh, art and the power and the work of artists, cultural workers, um, and people in these spaces can actually transform um, the systems that we're operating inside of. And so this is what this sort of event was all about, was to see what some of these visions are for the ways that we exist inside of and potentially transform um, capitalism and the systems of oppression that um, currently exist. Um, so uh, basically what's going to happen today is all of these wonderful artists are going to get an opportunity to introduce themselves and their work. Um, we're going to uh, do a little screening of some uh, video that occurred yesterday during our action in front of the New York City Stock Exchange, one of these sort of institutional bodies that tend to dominate our lives. Um, and then we're going to sort of have an open discussion um, where we will be posing questions to each other about some of these realities and their possibilities for change. So um, I guess I will start since I'm already talking just to introduce myself a little bit. So my name is Noah Ortega. Uh, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I consider myself mainly a performance artist. Um, thus, I make like live artwork that exists mainly, that is produced from like my body, um, rather than making objects or other sort of like visual representations of uh, the things that I'm thinking about. Um, I tend to work very conceptually um, and I tend to do a lot of like research. My practice is very much motivated by theory and um, things like that, of that nature. Um, so my piece yesterday was thus un like so far untitled, but was basically about debt um, and the way that debt is a sort of the central factor in the way that uh, financial systems currently operate, right? So like debt functions as like our debt functions as credit for um like banks financial institutions and people of incredible wealth um and so like what does a practice of refusal when it comes to paying back debt um like what might that generate this is sort of the question that i had right um I've been very interested in the concept of a debt strike and what it might mean for people on a mass scale to refuse to pay their debts um, and the way that that might impact the, the credit of 
major financial institutions, for example, right? Um, sort of linked to broader ideas about divestment um, and and the the power that like a consumer base might be able to exert that isn't just about putting more money into the system, but rather taking money out of the system. Um, so those are just some of the things that I've been thinking about. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more that we're going to talk about today. Um, but I have definitely talked way too much already. So I'm going to mute myself and sort of pass the torch on to the next person that would like to share just a little bit about themselves and their work. Um, whoever would like to go next can just sort of jump in. I'll go. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Um, yeah, I have an Aries moon, so I always, I'm always the one who will take the bite and go first. Um, but yeah, uh, my name's Alice. I am a recent student at Parsons School of Art and Design for Fine Arts, and I'm old, so it's kind of fun and weird and interesting, and a lot of that has to do with uh, my relationship to capitalism. Um, I make, I kind of think of myself as like a theater artist. Like I make art theater, theater because a lot of my stuff is scripted and uses song. And then I also make a lot of objects, but almost all of the things that I create have like a use to them or like do a thing, like an action. Um, like I'll bring her in. Uh, she's sitting here staring at me, so she wants to say hi. Um, so yeah, I make puppets. Uh, this one is the one that um, I used in my performance yesterday. And uh, I explore kind of the intersections of um, basically things that like the shadow or things in society that are hidden or veiled, but are very obvious and in plain sight, uh, kind of based in my personal experiences of like houselessness and being a sex worker publicly on the internet and having my, you know, body, all my whole body completely um, displayed for strangers and what that kind of like spectacleization of uh, identity and experience, especially of like pain or exploitation um, can do to a person, but more so like how, how we can transcend whatever like affect of imposed narratives of like subjugation uh, we experience. So definitely like very into kind of like making your trauma and pain work for you and like because capitalism wants to exploit it exploit the image of trauma and pain the spectacle of trauma the spectacle of of like the oppressed person uh especially now within neoliberal capitalism um so beyond making it work for you like i guess my piece yesterday was about uh how I have used my experiences of like very intense violence I've experienced being a sex worker uh, to make me a stronger person, but not in like a cheesy way, like menacing, like actually hyper intelligent and like kind of exploring the holy power of survival and how um, how hyper intelligent poor people are not in like a condescending um like uh, like fetishistic way of like street smarts versus uh you know intellectual smarts that it's all coming from the same place of uh, it's like a saint there's no logic to that assertion sorry i'm looking for like a like a thing that i wrote that i wanted to say uh but basically it was where is it okay oh yeah okay so the value of the complexity and depth of the underworld women's experience is a language of power unknown by capital. So like that to me is what magic is. Uh, and, you know, like it kind of is like a mystical, I don't know, like, uh, I guess in for way path of enlightenment, but like it's something you can only do if you're born into circumstances of certain kinds of oppression. Um, 
And uh, yeah, I don't know if any of that makes sense, but I'm a writer and uh, definitely super informed by theory as well. And um, I really want my work to have the effect of like inspiring other people to like not give a fuck and literally do like really push the limits on doing whatever you want. I mean, without hurting other people, but like what is possible and using sort of like Dadaist logic to like escape the constrictions of uh, capitalist social relations um, that are just kind of, and like using it against itself. Like I like to call like creepy dudes like weak or something like using like the logics of a, a value system against itself. So like patriarchy is like all about proving how strong it is, but calling patriarchy itself weak. Like, you know, only weak little bitches are like patriarchal abusers or something. That is what I would say to it. Like, I actually do say that to my clients who suck. It's, I mean, it's psycho. Anyways, um, anyways, yeah, uh, I really enjoyed yesterday. Um, I have a history of doing like public performance art and I haven't in a long time, uh, mostly because it is really overwhelming to do. And um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do it. So thank you. I rambled enough now too. <laughs> Thanks so much, Alice. Uh, don't feel bad about rambling. It's going to be the theme of the day, I feel like. Um, so yeah, whoever would like to jump in next. I, I could go. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Simone. And I describe myself as an interdisciplinary artist and researcher. Um, and, and I Somehow I fell into performance art and um, and then late last year I decided that I mostly focus on making work about water. It just somehow clicked for me last year. I don't know what happened, but I felt like I wanted to focus on water, which I feel is a really rich element to explore. And I feel like it can connect to a lot of different things. Um, and then lately I've been interested in making work about the body um and then also singing i'm really into jazz singing but i've never gotten the chance i don't know to explore singing the way i've wanted to or how to to include vocal practice sound practices with um movement and other stuff that i do so i'm really excited about that and um I feel like I'm a person on the edge or in the in-between. Um, I seem to be always moving around. And I feel like I just found my sense of place in the city. For the longest time, I've been like, where do I belong? I don't belong here and I'm always moving. But I feel like I finally found that sense of place, strangely, when I've decided to become bicoastal. Um, and life's always taking me somewhere. I feel like I don't really have a lot of control. So I do ground in my water art practice a lot because I feel like that's something that anchors me. And so what I did yesterday was, it's called Water on Wall Street because somehow I got wind that Wall Street started trading water. And so when I heard that, I was like, what does that mean? I, I don't know what that means. And then when I started researching, I still didn't know what it meant because I was like trying to figure out all this financial language. And so I slowly but surely just started researching what does it mean to, for Wall Street to trade water? And it goes in all sorts of directions. It goes, it traces back to California and California has its own water history. And I, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time out West. So I'm trying to talk to people out West about water in California and other Western states, but it goes in all sorts of directions. I was researching about how Wall Street financed the transatlantic slave trade and, um, and, uh, and how I feel like trading water is basically a business strategy to make money off of water scarcity and drought. And you can market it any kind of way you want. And um, <laughs> and this may be a little conspiracy theory, but I feel like news articles purposely go out to support 
a lot of this world making um, and you couldn't tell the difference, but um, I think I think for me, what I was, the action I was trying to convey a lot. I wish I would have had a bigger sign, but it's more than just about water. It's about the economy. It's about um, life. Like how are we how are we able to live life? How are we able to have relationships? Because capitalism governs and shapes so much of life, and it just it just feels really multidimensional. It goes in all these directions. So I think the most important thing for me is, is just trying to understand what's going on. Um, um, and yeah, I wish I had a bigger, bigger sign. Um, and yeah, that's all I want to share. Thank you, Simone. We'll get you a bigger sign next time. We'll make a giant one that just like fills up the whole space. Um, cool. Thank you, though. Um, so, Geraldo, April, whoever wants to go next. I'll go. Uh, hi, my name is April. Um, I uh, would describe my work as um, performance and video and community uh, archiving and actions um, that uh, are looking to upend or uh, topple uh, dominant narratives uh, that exist in society. And those dominant narratives are usually maintained by those who are in power. Geraldo. Uh, well, thank you, April. <laughs> um, my, my name is Geraldo Mercado. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, I, you'll have to excuse me. It's really difficult for me to um, discuss like a, a performance directly after uh, it happened. I will I will go out of my way typically <laughs> to to avoid discussing a work for for several weeks until I've had, had a chance to sort of like like process it, sit with it. I don't look at documentation. Um, or anything. I, I usually don't look at documentation until it's time to 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 share it. Um, but I do like talking about my my work once there's a little bit of um, of of space between the the actions. Um, yeah, I, I would consider myself a multidisciplinary artist. Like I do performance. Um, I make short films. I uh, sometimes create objects, sometimes create um, images, but um, you know, I, I say all that in in theory and in, in practice, I am like a performance artist. you know, I've created um, like I said about about roughly 200 unique performances. so that's uh, not counting ones I've repeated. Um, um, in the last 10 years, whereas I've created like five short films, you know? Um, so I, I consider myself a, a performance artist, um, um, first and foremost. Um, my work, I, I don't really read theory, you know? It's a little embarrassing to to admit, but I don't have the, the uh, I don't have the, uh, attention span for it. I do read the cliff notes and enjoy it. You know, I feel like I, I, I got really into um, punk rock and horror movies when I was 13. And that's still very much my, my wheelhouse. And I feel like I developed my politics um, by getting really into the band Crass as a teenager and kind of uh, that's that's what's informed my uh, my worldview since then, pretty much. Um, and I, I feel like when I um, create a a performance, it's um, uh, a, a lot of the energy that I bring to it is like a desire to um, uh, to, to, to see myself like performing with like a group like that, you know, back in the, back in the day, like you're a kid listening to music and you're like, wow, I want to do, 
uh, I want to do this. And performance art kind of, for me, um, was the uh, end point of that, of that desire. Um, and yeah, I think I um, like, like thoughts about um, capital. Um, I've always been um, prevalent in, um, in my work in, in one way or another, but I guess I, I, I feel like I should save that discussion when we go into the, the, the pieces uh, proper. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, I know it's a little sort of silly to try and like summarize like what your practice is in, in five minutes. So I appreciate um, uh, you all like even giving it a try. So um, thank you so much for that. So I think now what we were gonna do is show some footage from yesterday, um, this action that we did in front of the stock exchange. Um, so April, if you wanna get that set up, um, I think we'll just tuck in. That's going to be about like a 20 minute sort of situation. Um, so, yeah. Just, I think this will be good, um, like context and just to get some like visuals and some, um, uh, yeah, context of what exactly we are going to be like discussing.
it's like, well, is there another
Joe Biden, I love it. Make sure you fight for for me. Uh, we have to say a huge thank you to um, Elizabeth Lamb for capturing that video footage. Um, and thank you, April, for getting that edited very, very quickly um, so we could show that today. Um, this is a very rough cut. <laughs> that's okay. Um, I like it rough. It's fine. Um I really love being able to like see that I was I was obviously very sort of like masked up and couldn't see a lot of what was happening around me. So it was um, I really appreciate getting to see um, all of the work that you that you all did. Um, so so now that we have sort of that those images, um, that context, um, I thought now we could sort of transition. We have about an hour left, which I think is just a perfect amount of time to have a robust discussion. Um, just around, again, some of the, the bigger questions that are coming up for all of us um, through not only this work, but through our process of putting these pieces together and just kind of like, I know, at least for me, the context of like my life. Um, so uh, what I thought we would do is that I would just start with a question. We would just sort of see where that leads us. And if folks have further questions or thoughts, um, we could just sort of like let the conversation develop as it will. Um, so I guess the, the question that I would like to pose first, um, and it was sort of interesting to me, sort of in terms of watching this video, was the simultaneous action, right? The way that we were all sort of like doing our own thing. We were all obviously individuals inside of the, the experience. Um, but it became sort of this collective um, motion forward, right? Like this collective movement. Um, and I keep rem I'm reminded of this phrase, um, the or this image of the social hydra, right? So this like mini headed beast that can attack from like multiple different angles. Um, uh, that is ultimately one creature, but each head kind of has its own unique um, and individual subjective sort of position and experience. Um, so I'm sort of interested in the way that you all experienced the, not only like the individual experience of doing this, but also what it was like for you doing it, um, collectively and sort of what that means for not only your work, um, as an artist, but what you sort of see as the, 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 the work of like a collective body in dismantling some of these like conditions that we exist under. That was a complicated question, but hopefully something will come through for you all. So position of the individual and the collective, how are they related? How do they interact for you? Um, yeah. Um, I'll, I can start again, um, Aries Moon again. Uh, but yeah, I really, uh, when I'm performing, I go like it's almost like the most internal feeling that I have like I feel so like psychically in a bubble and like I have to do that because um 
engaging unless it's like a piece specifically about engaging with the public or with the audience or whoever other people um but that's just like to preserve like the I don't know my stream of consciousness and not get distracted from whatever like mission I'm doing in uh in whatever performance so it was also really amazing to see how everyone else was functioning as well uh and doing or functioning what everyone was doing um and I feel like it really went together very cohesively and like organically, like even aesthetically and movement wise, it really felt like there was some kind of cohesion. And that to me like speaks to the sort of like phenomenon I've had and like, I've done a lot of group public performances, but like where even if you're not even like looking at each other, like try getting cues from each other, like somehow I don't know like the energy will just kind of like more if everyone's if you're open to it like it like guides you and there's this sort of group cohesion from that um and I just think that's some kind of spiritual phenomenon or something like that I don't know how that happens but it always it always seems to happen um like coincidental things or synchronicities like and some of the things in the perform, like even with the public, like that guy on the bike, like picking up the flowers while you were spinning and you were like touching, I don't know, this frozen like object. Like I couldn't really tell what it was, um, but it looked like a like a amorphous like popsicle or something like that. I don't know. Um, like that kind of stuff is just like. I don't, I feel like it just breaks the reality open or something. It's like a tear in, you know, the drudgery of daily life. Uh, what is that one? I have this book, the uh, revolution of everyday life or something. It feels like situationist or whatever. It's like creating the context for that kind of magical and otherworldly or poetic um, experience to exist. And I really focus on how like that in my work on these kind of like poetic synchronicities can be like almost like life saving and like signs of something more than whatever like traumatic or oppressive or mundane experience like you're having in society as a result of capitalism and systems of oppression. Um, so like to be doing that in a context where others are also doing it really does feel like, you know, I try to be realistic and not go into like too intense of like utopian like or like grant like delusions of grandeur of like what my art is doing or not doing. But like I do really think that um, it does have a strong effect at, like people seeing that in like a group doing that versus like an end I mean it's such a different thing when you see like one person doing a crazy performance versus like a group like because the group has power and people associate groups with having more power so like I just wonder how um strongly it affected the audience and the people who are walking by um and I mean, that's just like the kind of thing that like if you were like a preteen and you saw and you're a weird artist person, you saw that you'd be like, oh, my God, this is crazy. Like people can actually do this. Like I want to do that. I mean, I would have I was kind of doing weird performance art when I was in middle school, though. Like anyways, I've, I've been doing this shit a long time. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and it's healing for that reason, too, to like be doing it in a group or like it's invigorating and enriching um, because some of my like best childhood memories are of like me being like, let's put on the craziest outfit we can and like walk around the neighborhood and scream at people <laughs> like kind of shit. Ooh, I don't know who's that's not for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, it's just very uh, for my practice, like, you know, um, especially with COVID, uh, you know, it can feel very isolating uh, to be making. And I've made a lot of video work because of that and during COVID time and got into that. And a lot of the audio I was playing was like uh, videos that I had made. Like I made this 
porn that was like me basically reading society of the spectacle or like not but like there's an audio recording of that book um kind of as like uh making fun of my clients for fetishizing like the person that you know me as like the hot art girl like making fun of them directly to their face um and have like watching people moving to and like uh the sound that was playing from my it's not for me i have no <laughs> coming stop ringing my doorbell i'm in the middle of an artist talk um but uh yeah so that was cool to see the way that things that i did affected other people's like and the delivery of like their thing like when geraldo was uh i forget what you were doing you're doing something i wrote it down actually because i what was it? Um, but my mute, it was like the clown face and the music. It was like a very like, um, I don't know, cinematic moment, I guess. Uh, so I'm going to stop rambling again um, and just say, yeah, it really meant it was very enriching to my practice. Uh, and it's not for me. <laughs> I have no guests coming um, right now, but uh, very enriching um, and helping to like break out of the alienation and isolation of like COVID and art world stuff and everything. So yeah, definitely inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like um, for, for, for me, one of my uh, assets as a performance artist is the uh, ability to just to completely control a, a, a space like when I'm performing somewhere like um, like parallel for example um, a sort of having these defined uh, boundaries have you know knowing who is there to be engaged with the work and then being able to completely, hold their their attention for half an hour or or however long um I, I yeah I I feel like as a as a performance artist that's the the uh most important thing in my uh toolbox for me above anything else and so doing a um a, a public performance where the audience is really uh transitory you know where people come and go and they are not there to be engaged with the the work. I feel like that is um, very much outside of my uh, comfort zone. It's only something I've um, done a handful of times as, um, as an artist. And it's always been, um, it's always been a very different e experience than everything else that I've done. So I think in, um, you know, especially there's been times where I've done it where, yes, it's a public performance, but people kind of expect something um, to be happening. Like um, the times we did like Lumen Festival, for example. Um, and so this was, this was a very different uh, experience for me. I don't think um, it would have been um, as successful for me if I wasn't doing it with other people simultaneously. Like if if I had just uh, decided to show up uh, at uh, Wall Street on a random day dressed as Leatherface, I don't think it would have uh, resulted in anything nearly as um, as as special because. Um, yeah, the, uh, the fact that there was other people there sort of, um, allowed me to be like, okay, you know, this is very much a part of my, uh, artistic practice. It's still like, um, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still admired in the same, um, like, 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 I, like, I guess I was just able to, to to contextualize it as not being um, that different than, than what I'm used to doing, you know? Um, and I, um, one of the things I, I noticed the, the entire time and uh, I feel like we all commented on after the fact is that 
there were some, you know, we were doing some weird shit and people were there with cameras and they were pointing their cameras in such a way so that they were framing the, you know, they, they wanted shots of the, of the buildings and they didn't want to get any of the weird shit in those, in those shots. You know, it's people kind of went there with a purpose. The purpose was seeing wall street, seeing the New York stock exchange. And, um, I, I I think about yeah the the sheer amount of of human suffering caused by those uh, uh, institutions, and I think about you know our utopian ideals as as artists and people being like, all right, let me not get the artists in this shot of the New York Stock Exchange, you know. Um, but I also um, there was a lot of people who were really positively engaging with the work and yeah if if I had um I, I I didn't see the moment where the delivery driver grabbed the the flowers um so I was really happy to to be able to to see it now since I feel like that um <laughs> I I I I feel like that person engaged with what I was doing in exactly the way that I that I wanted him to um but yeah, I, I, I feel like it was a really successful afternoon of um, of performance art um, uh, because it was a, uh, I, I think the collective action was a big part of that. Yeah, I just really love this idea of like multiple points of resistance that are operating in simul like simultaneous ways, right, rather than just like you flip the switch on the light bulb turns on no it's an entire like uh grid of like lights um if you don't pardon the metaphor right so it like becomes so much more powerful so much more brighter um and people have a more difficult time to look away right if they're trying to take a picture of the stock exchange they have to be very they have to be very creative in order to ignore us um and it actually forces them maybe this is me projecting but i feel i feel like it forces them to engage with the space in an, in an entirely different way like the things that they have to choose to ignore the way that they have to choose to position themselves the way that they have to choose to position their cameras um actually forces them to take a new perspective on the space entirely which is i think potentially powerful even when they're trying to ignore us they're like still forced to move their body in like a different way like literally somatically it forces them to like engage in the space differently and i think that can have like an interesting effect um even like long term right like they're gonna look at those photos and be like why is this so weird oh that's right those weird artists were there um and and yeah and if it was just like one person it's very easy to sort of ignore the one person um and i think that happens also a lot in new york city right like there's a lot of stuff that's like easy to ignore um because it's isolated um but then when you see it sort of all happening at once it's like very very present um and is going to have like a greater impact on you sort of in the long term regardless of whether or not you engaged with it directly or not in the moment. Um, so yeah, I just also thought of another quote that I wanted to share. Um, the quote is from this book called Molecular Revolutions. Um, and the quote is, when people are happy together, it becomes subversive behavior. Um, and I think that that is certainly my experience yesterday where it was like, um, I haven't been necessarily even socializing with a lot of people at once for a long time um and so to be together with people that i like and respect doing this like very sort of wonderful and cathartic um you know thing that is coming from my physical body you know and we're all doing things with our bodies in the space together um not only is that like invigorating again as an indiv on an individual level it also becomes like incredibly powerful on a social level um and so like what i guess i'm interested in sort of thinking about the ways that we can sort of like cultivate that sort of subversive togetherness um not only like in our art or through our art but like on like a wider social scale you know
go for it, Alice. Sorry if you had something to say. Okay. Yeah, that is such a great point. And it really, um, it really hits the nail on the head of like kind of a thing that I've been trying, I've been like thinking a lot about of like happiness being like within our society that is like, especially now because of like, you know, so social media like is so specifically like about the spectacle of like a representation of one form of like power or like way you're supposed to be that will signify to others that like, you know, you're, you know, successful in a certain kind of way, but it's obviously very unreal and thinking about like how to be like confrontational in an indirect way. And like, cause like, I don't really feel like, um, I mean, sometimes I think being like very directly aggressive, like with performance art can be effective in certain ways, but like, I just don't feel safe doing that. Like, you know, because I'm like, I have like a partially paralyzed hand. And if somebody like, I've seen my friends get assaulted for being crazy, you know, like, um, with their performances and I just I don't know why I'm taking it this this direction but I just don't want that to happen and I really think that um yeah just the presence of a group of people who are like clearly doing something that is like specifically empowering for us and like could be for other people uh, in that context like what you're talking about of people having to like look away um with their cameras, like point, get us out of the frame. Like those are probably tourists who have a lot of money. Like someone who's coming to like take a picture of the New York Stock Exchange on vacation is probably very like used to being able to completely control their whole environment all the time. And like to take that control away from them when like, I think that we're all people who are constantly having to like modify our way of being to like fit into like that universe of like those people's comfort when it's like actually I feel more comfortable playing with the giant doll that I made and pouring fake blood out of her body in front of you just sitting here doing this and you can't really stop me I mean they could have called the cops or something but like I think it was really powerful that like we were just like doing the thing and I also like just want to add that as far as the group cohesion goes, like everybody's piece was pretty eerie. And I really liked that. Like there was like this kind of like spookiness, like you were wearing the long white gown, Simone, and like the, like even like the chair, the chair on the table and then all everyone wearing masks. And like, there's a lot of like, I don't know, the color coordination was also kind of cool. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. We're all like wearing like black kind of look official in this way, like, or a white nightgown, which is also like, kind of like a symbol of something. I don't know, like a vintage white nightgown really feels like it's like heavily loaded in this way. And um, like, it makes you think of ghosts or like rich old ladies or something like that, um, or both, you know, rich old lady ghosts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, I forgot what I the rest I was gonna say, but yeah, I think um, happiness and doing things that are enriching and empowering um, that are completely non-normative in public is a very real tool to like destroy people's conceptions of like what is possible um, and open them to more possibilities. Uh, and I love that like also through perform, I mean, performance art is like generally goes in like a deranged or ab and abject direction usually like there's some level of like and that I mean the emotional medium of derangement I think is like is specifically powerful because a lot of the times it's not directly confrontational like talking to yourself like you know I was like talking to myself and like you know treating this doll like a child and like people were kind of disarmed by that and um it like gets under people's skin and I'm just constantly trying to figure out different methods of like making an impact that like it's I don't know how to describe it but like or maybe I'm still trying to figure out how to describe this thing I'm trying to do with my art which is like um 
it's almost like reminding people, like letting people know it's not screaming at them. It's not like you have to listen to me because that will make people defensive, but just like being there, it will force people to think about something. And like, I don't know, I think it's like a really powerful, like tool of like feminine manipulation. And that's another thing in my art. Like I, I explore ways that people have to survive that are not like moral, you know, like people having to use, like, I have to lie and manipulate my clients and like psychologically control them basically. And they're cheating on their wives. Like, I don't think any form of labor is moral under capitalism. It's not like, and I'm just saying that as a sex worker, cause there's kind of this push to assimilate like this kind of like sex work being this like great thing that heals people and most sex workers don't think that or care and that's not most sex workers experiences because like when you live in poverty and you're trying to get out of it like everyone knows you have to do like fucked up shit to do that um so it's not like I don't give a fuck about healing these people like I don't care I mean I like some of them some of them are nice but it's like you know um yeah, breaking down narratives of like fetishized morality or like do gooderness is like so important to me as an attack against neoliberal like conceptions of what power is. Uh, because like I don't have the opportunity, no, most people don't have the opportunity to be like totally moral people under capitalism, you know, like uh, it's like, I guess, uh, individualism in that regard is weird, but I, yeah, anyways, um, yeah, definitely great. I'll let somebody else talk now. <laughs> wow. I have so many thoughts. It's like, I don't even know what to say. Cause I have so many thoughts and like, just digesting what everyone's saying. Um, Wow. Uh, I think my first thing, my thoughts are going to be kind of jumbled, but like when I was thinking of, and first I'm just like, just want to say thank you for everyone's sh shares. I'm just like tr tr trying to make sure I, I keep up with what people are saying because I have this thing with memory. But um, when I was th thinking about my performance, I was really thinking about like, what could I do? <laughs> you know, like, what could you do on Wall Street? What could you do at the New York Stock Exchange? And I planned on go wandering to the water, but I only got to a certain place and I passed the bowl. And I really was like, what could I, what could you do here? Like, um, I guess that's questions about approach. Like, do you want to approach softly? Do you want to approach like, you want to run into the crowd that's gathered around the bowl and be like, they're, they're trading water. They're trading water. Don't, don't you know what's going on? And then I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm like a person that just wants to fuck shit up. But then I'm also like, Oh, but I don't want to, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And <laughs> Cause I really wanted to like run into that crowd of people around the bowl and just like, I don't know. But then I didn't. And then I was telling Polly and I was like, oh, I wish I would have done this. Um, Pauline was taking photographs. And so there's just this question of like, what could, what could I have done? And then I'm like ruminating about like my style and like I could have done this better. And I think the way, I think I'm like that because I'm really interested in, if this is really helpful to talk about and reflect on what we, we did because I tend to, it's hard for me to understand change. Like if someone says, um, we're not gonna pollute this river anymore. And then we're, and now we're gonna set up like five workshops to talk about how we're not gonna pollute this river. So the way that I think I'm like, okay, well, we're not gonna pollute the river anymore. And so we're working towards not polluting the river. So it's confusing if I'm in a process where we're doing all this talking and all this whatever, but it's not really about the river not being polluted anymore. It's just like a lot of performance. So it's hard for me to, when I think of like change and transformation or whatever, it's like hard for me to understand like doing something, but that's not really what, it, what it's about. And so um, I think that informed a lot, that informs a lot of 
of how I work, which is why I'm really interested in play because everything's not always about like, and there is this sense, which I've heard in a recent Zoom call, it's, I guess it's very like US centered where there's this messages of like changing the world. And I got that message in high school, like changing the world. Um, but then it's like, how does change happen if you don't address it? How does change happen? Um, and I just have, I guess that's what's swirling in my mind when, it, when I think of my individual performance, because I'm like, um, I just feel like there's, I just, I feel really frustrated. <laughs> I feel really frustrated because um, I guess the word that comes to mind is like, when will X, Y, or Z finally happen? I guess that's, that's the question. So I guess, I, I guess I'm just saying that we're like, I'm just, I guess underlying my my performance is like how can I how can I make an impact because we're talking about impact and effect, which is why I'm so bummed about my small signs and what I could have done better. But um, but also I think it's really powerful to like roll up at the New York Stock Exchange. <laughs> I thought it was so cool to like walk down the street and see everyone and everyone. And then Noah was like, okay, we're gonna start in five minutes. And that was just a really great feeling to be in a group and find our place and perform in, in, in front of this huge institution. Like we're literally in front of the physical um, st structure pillars of, that are holding up the economy of the, the, the country. And it's and you and I was looking at it and it just feels like a curtain, you know, like who's in there? <laughs> Can't see anyone. It just feels very mysterious. And so I really love that we we did that. I just and I'm like, oh, I, there's this feeling. I was like, let's do it again. Let's do it again. And um, so uh, and I think. I think it's helpful for me to like tell tell myself and to verbalize um, like just being just having presence there. I felt was um, really really important because it, for me it felt like um, you know the the con you know things aren't just suddenly changing and we're in our post capitalist future, but it feels like pushing an edge, you know, like just pushing a little bit further. Um, and surprisingly, you know, the cops didn't bother us. It was actually kind of peaceful, <laughs> kind of peaceful. And, um, there were so many things that people, people said, um, darn it. And I wanted to comment on some things, but, um, yeah, it's just like, I'm, I guess I'm also confused as to why the New York Stock Exchange and the Bull are like tourists tourist destinations it feels really I've always walked around the bowl because I lived in Staten Island I'm always around that area so I it just clicked for me that like this is like a tourist destination so I feel that's maybe that's a mechanism of capitalism I'm like how did these places become tourist areas because that's a form of protection with the people taking their you know taking the photographs and and uh, yeah, just it just feels um, or I, I don't know what I'm I don't know I, I I think it was a physical like a physical visible disruption to for the tourists maybe um, and I think it would be great to see more of those kinds of disruptions at these really powerful places. Um, and uh, I, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, April, I, you just haven't uh, said much yet, so I just wanted to uh, pass you the torch if you uh, had some thoughts. I, mean, I really just like listening to everyone. I think, uh, I mean, that's a big part of like community archiving and like um, kind of like understanding people's like perspectives um like listening is super important um in that regard and sort of letting people sort of 
yeah, expand upon, um, yeah, what they're thinking, how they're thinking it. I mean, I think that's like a huge part of why, you know, I am drawn to kind of, a, you know, sort of uh, prompts like this. Um, the fact that, you know, um, five individuals can show up and all have five individually unique uh, or different performances or actions, but uh, there could still potentially be um, overlaps or, um, you know, uh, discontinuities or, or all sorts of different conversations that are happening, um, uh, you know, live and then sort of even like post performance or, you know, without, even without like this kind of context happening, like it's, uh, I think Geraldo was speaking earlier, sort of how, like, they don't like to unpack their, their things or the, the things that have happened just yet. And like, that's also where like, sort of conversations uh, can kind of percolate to uh, in that moment of silence or the, that kind of idea of, of waiting to sort of see what uh, comes um, in the after sort of effect of things. Um, yeah, I actually get a lot of anxiety performing in general. And I think in public, uh, even more so. Um, and when I first started performing uh, in public, I did a lot. Uh, I mean, I, didn't, I mostly wear masks performing in public. Um, and I, you know, I'd be like a miss to not, uh, you know, reference uh, my good friend Preach Our Son, who has been uh, sort of instrumental in sort of doing uh, sort of activist, uh, provocative uh, actions in the street uh, during times of civil unrest and during times of, um, you know, um, moments that uh, are, you know, moments that are taking place in our country in the US specifically that are, um, you know, have catastrophic uh, effects. Uh, in all sorts of different ways uh, in society. So I think, um, yeah, it's sort of this like uh, provoking nature of the outdoor action of the public action is something that I was drawn to. Um, yeah, and bringing, you know, giant gold letters that just said the word war uh, and sort of just placing them in front of uh, a building that is probably responsible uh, for financing uh, many wars. Uh, and also, I think, like, kind of speaking to Simone's point, like, why are people down there? And I think, like, we're sort of taught this, like, American exceptionalism and this professionalism and professions and this idea that like money and success are equated to each other and i think people want to be a part of that and i think that this idea that going down there and like basking in the presence of this like horrible monster uh in some people's eyes will sort of maybe some of that would like rub off on them in some way or shape or form like you know if i get my photo in front of the stock exchange like <laughs> maybe like I too will be successful or something like that. There's this idea that like um, we all benefit uh, as people uh, because of this institution. And uh, you know, it was the 10th anniversary of Occupy Wall Street uh, really recently last week, I think it was. Um, and Zuccotti Park is like right down the street, right around the corner, literally. Um, and you know, not much is really, I mean, there were things that were good about that, but like not much has changed except for uh, the debt has increased. Um, and then you think about like the 2008 uh, recession and like the bank bailouts and like all those banks you see on the stock ticker that were all bailed out. Um, and, you know, people were left to, to figure it out on their own. So, um, I think a lot about like a, abandonment uh, when I when I see that building, um, abandonment of like regular people, regular 
people who are, were told that if they just work hard enough, they will be able to succeed in this country. And that's um, really something that's used against people and more as a way to control people. Yeah, that um, that is something that I am like on that last point, something that I is very, very present in my thoughts pretty much constantly um, these days, particularly as I'm like been unemployed for a while and sort of questioning the, the like need for work or the, the desire for work or the uh, imposition of needing to work hard, whatever. Um, and I just find it so so interesting, right? That, that Wall Street, the Stock Exchange, um, the World Trade Center, and Trinity Church all sort of share this like same like four block radius, right? This sort of centralized location of this American mythology of like money being religion, being God, we worship through our product of labor, um, and then we'll be blessed with success and uh increase um yeah and, i mean like, there was yeah. uh people walking by uh with 9-11 museum gift bags like they had just been right. to the 9-11 museum and wanted to stroll past the stock exchange right we like visit visit these shrines to capitalism where we can pay deference and and like you said april like maybe if we take the photo we will get some sort of like gift um from from capital to to bless us with like success and I think it's really part of this, like, Can I... the, oh yeah, go, go ahead, Simone. Sorry, sorry, I wanted to, I wanted to, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to jump in there because I wanted to, I like, uh, well, sorry to interrupt. It's just that that word blessed really quickly because mm -hmm. um, spiritual, I feel like spirituality is a big part of my practice, but I just wanted to tack on to what you're saying that I think, I think it's really important to, I don't know, call out or redirect, like when people say um, that they're blessed, like it, it, it gets confused with the systemic issues. So it can really be harmful to, <laughs> to it can be really harmful to describe what maybe what's called privileges. I have to put it in quotes because mm -hmm. I have as blessings when it's systemic systemic structures that allow maybe someone to be in a certain position. Okay, sorry, just had to. No, you, you don't need to apologize. Thank, thank you for that. Um, uh, just, yeah, uh, I guess I chose that language because I do feel like there is almost a, not, not necessarily a spiritual connection to money, but a religious connection to money in this country. Um, and so I, I use that language in uh, like an ironic way, but, um, uh, uh, but I get what you're saying and, and like shifting our relationship to like the way that we understand um, uh, the way like privilege functions, I think is really important and like understanding that, yeah, it's not some sort of higher power situation. It's literally like the system, the, the structure of, of the system, which offers sort of people opportunities or pathways forward and like the ability to access these sorts of things. Um, and it's not, um, uh, it's not through hard work ever almost right it's people have privilege whether they're born into money they have access to certain um like economic structures or educational structures um and it's uh uh but like turned on uh made toxic in a way that if you're not able to like access those things well oh it's because you're you're lazy it's because you haven't worked hard enough it's because you don't have enough fortitude um and uh so like a, a big part of what my piece was about was really sort of the practice of refusal and what does it mean to refuse these myths to refuse this imposition to refuse to pay our debts to society right like why do we need to be um like, why do we need to prove our worth in these sorts of ways? Um, people should be allowed, to, we're all humans on this planet, we should be allowed to exist in, in that way. Just allowed to exist. We shouldn't have to prove that we are worthy of existing. We're not, you know, worthy to have a home, worthy to have enough food to eat, worthy to do da-da-da-da-da. Um, that is, I, I find, like, not 
um, obviously not conducive to like uh, building um, a society that like helps everyone, right? Because it, it forces us into these positions of like having, again, to prove our value to um, society. So I really am interested in this idea of refusal as a practice. And I think it goes along actually with like patience also as like a process of, of uh, as like a mode of refusal, right? To like wait um, and to not be sort of in such a rush to prove ourselves. Um, and so like, you know, thinking about ways that we can refuse to be a part of the system, even in small ways, um, I think can be just a really powerful like resistance against these these impositions. I um, mean, finding creative ways, because like sort of the problem with all of this is that we still need to exist inside of capitalism, right? Like we all still need money. We all still need to pay rent. We all still need to buy food. We all still need to like take care of ourselves and pay our electricity bill and all of that crap. Um, so how how we can sort of find that balance between taking care of our needs and also like refusing to participate in oppressive or exploitative systems. Um, and I think, again, coming back to like the collective, for me, that's what I find is sort of the best way to escape some of these things is to get outside of the individualistic sort of mythology of America, that if you as an individual just work hard, you can achieve success, um, but rather to refuse to participate and rather turn towards each other in order to bolster and hold up um, the um, our, our endeavors, right? Whether that's whatever that might be. Can I, can I jump in uh, for a second? Um, There's just uh, something I noticed. So um, so April, uh, when you were speaking, you had called the uh, people working in Wall Street uh, monsters. And I thank you for that. Um, and I think uh, Alice had also mentioned how we all sort of embodied the, the eerie, you know, either like the ethereal white robes or just, you know, uh, I was literally dressed as a movie monster, you know. Um, the word uh, monster and the word demonstrate have the same, uh, linguistically, they, they, they have the same root word because you have, you have uh, uh, monsters which uh, are, how do, how do I say it? Um, like cautionary tales, you know, fairy tales that you tell children the the monsters demonstrate a morality um and um i i know for that that was that was a big consideration for um for my piece because you know my, my piece was based on the movie uh the texas chainsaw massacre which is a sort of a i like to um use the repetition of phrases in in my work like i'll take a song or or a, a phrase and just ring as much meaning out of it as I can across uh, several performances. So, you know, uh, one, I, I like to uh, repeat the phrase, it's going to be okay. That's one of, that's a, a well that I have, um, you know, collected water from many times. And so this uh, phrase, who will survive and what will be left of them was something that uh, by chance I kind of included in the um, Zoom performance I did for uh, Performancy Forum last year. And I kind of uh, brought that, I, I wanted to bring that same energy to onto the Wall Street performance. Cause yeah, the, the uh, movie I'm referencing is literally about uh, class struggle. And I was like, okay, what if we, uh, what would it be like to, to transplant like this, this monster from one location um, to the other? But in reality, the, the, the real monsters are, <laughs> the, the real monsters weren't us. It was, it was, is, you know, uh, they're, they're usually in, in the buildings behind us Mondays through Fridays, you know? And, and so we, uh, uh, we we brought the sort of aesthetically eerie into into a place of of actual uh, monstrosity, and I you know I really like that for us. I think just quickly on that note too, it's like um, you know I think the there's this idea that like 
Um, and it, sometimes in horror movies, it is true. Uh, the person wearing the mask is the killer, but like this idea that like to be evil, you need to be like wearing a mask or, or be like have this kind of specific look about you. But yeah, the people like you're saying, Geraldo, basically the people who are, you know, who might be really the monsters uh, are people that aren't, aren't really necessarily wearing masks or aren't necessarily, um, you know, this kind of like, it's like, it's like the suit and tie is sort of a, is sort of a monster uh, attire in a way. This idea that we all need to wear our American flag lapels and like a suit and tie and then we're good to go. We're professional. Um, is like, that's sort of like the, the monstrous attire that I think of as well. Yeah, I think that's really interesting and actually connects back to what um, Alice was talking about earlier about deviancy um, and the way that we were able to sort of like subvert that and reclaim like deviant behavior, deviant action or deviant presence um, in order to make like this larger point about um, uh, the way that we exist in the world. Um, and I think that that is really interesting. Can I jump in? I feel very passionate about something uh, that I, uh, making sure something is said, which is okay, that like, okay, you're talking about refusal. And I think it's really important to understand that like refusal is going to look very different for every individual and like group of people because um you know like i existed and i'm saying this as like someone who existed completely basically completely outside of society for like over a decade and um i'm now entering into academia because i realized like at the end of the day like as someone who was like forced not by choice into like complete like crisis and chaos and instability as a result of like you know my family upbringing whatever um and then not being able to break not being able to break those patterns which are so constraining of like you know if you grow up in really extreme crisis and trauma all the time and like financial instability and all of these things like that is the pattern that capitalism has put on you and like my piece was a lot about how like for those of us who have had that experience like what refusal is is like might look more like focusing on traditional success like might look like on stability or like i mean anything to me it's like stability and security and safety are very sacred to people who like I've almost been abducted and murdered at my job like several times. So it's like for me, hyper focus on safety and like, you know, understanding the sacredness and the value and importance of like my own life and the life of people like me who are, you know, treated like sex workers are treated as like literally disposable, you know? So I think that like to circumvent like the hypnosis of our capitalist society we have to like basically just completely like switch things in this like but like also create new ways to be at the same time so it's like the answer it's like the liberals are like yes so that means like sex workers should be president or something like that I don't know like just like okay now a new kind of you know, an oppressed person in a position of power it's like that's how we're going to change things but that's not how things change it's just assimilation and um so like, yeah, I just think that because people who, especially poor people, anyone who's like a part of a demographic that's like considered unintelligent and unskilled, like homeless people, uh, like are not respected for what wisdom and knowledge they really do have. Like when I was homeless and I was around a lot of other homeless people all the time, like it was just straight up communism because it had to be like, we all shared everything, made decisions together. I mean, there'd be some wing nut every once in a while who became like in different groups, there'd be like cultish leaders. And that's also like a funny, I don't know. Leadership is an interesting thing too. I'm kind of against the notion of leadership as a whole because 
I think that our culture, everyone was talking about like religiousness. I think our culture is literally basically a big uh, macrocosm of cults. Like it's all cults. It's all like the energy that of like believing so hard in something is spiritual. Like, I think it's demonic, like personally, like talking about monsters, like they are like literally in my personal spiritual worldview, capitalism is, um, kind of its own demonic entity that like spiritually possesses people. And so a lot of my work is kind of like framed in the context of it being like an exorcism of like, I don't know. Um, and that we can learn that the best from people who have like gotten themselves out of like really extremely horrible situations, you know, like, cause it's like people say refusal and then they're like, that means no money eating only out of the garbage and it's like I lived with a trust fund kid who would like steal my fancy like whole foods cheese I'd buy with my hooker money and then they'd be like well I make you food and it's like yeah with like you know like the uh, decaying yams from the Walmart dumpster like it's just not like you can't just like put the same mo model of like rebellion because then rebellion itself is just a spectacle and it's devoid of actual real impact and meaning so, you know, it was more rebellious for me to buy nice cheese as someone who's like not always been able to do that uh, versus like my friend or my ex-friend, she ain't my friend anymore, um, <laughs> but uh, like stealing my food and like basically criticizing me for like buying food at, at Whole Foods. Like these kinds of things actually do take up so much space. And I think it's really obnoxious and ignorant, like, um, you know, everyone constantly surveilling each other's behavior to see if it fits into this like mold of, I mean, this was my experience in the communities I was in that were radical or radical anarchist, whatever, uh, is it was like, yeah, just rebellion became a spectacle. You had to do specific things to be considered like rebelling in the right way. And that kind of created a cultish, very like elitist environment where usually the people who had the most power in those communities were people who were used to having power and knowing how to wield it versus like me and my friends being like psycho fucking freaks and just freaking out and like doing socially unacceptable things, but like to like get away from those dynamics. So um, anyways, just like homeless people are very wise, not in a condescending way, but like literally actually smart in knowing how to take care of one another. And I think that people who, we should be looking at people who are forced outside of society for like the answers, they're there. It's not that really that mystical or crazy, like how would we have a radical society? It just like takes people putting in the effort to like decenter their basically, you know, egotistical insecurities and selfishness. So oh, anyways, I got a lot to say about this shit. I'm writing like a whole, thing like basically about the spectacle of trauma and spectacle like of trauma porn and the exploitation of like traumatized individual stories to basically get people social capital you know and relieve them of usually class or white guilt or something like that and um because I think it's very very insidious the way that that functions and we see it happening on like you know higher and higher scales like I saw um, uh, a comic that was like, it was like a courtroom and it was like a case of like prosecuting someone for so like having like for life imprisonment for like selling weed or something like that. And like the prosecutor is like, before we like take you to jail, can you please tell me your pronouns, like your preferred pronouns? So it's like, I don't know, shit like that, where it's like, yeah, anyways, the most monstrous thing to me is like, when people act like they're helping or changing things, but they're actually controlling and reinforcing the neoliberal power dynamics that like basically make it where we're living in a fucking like demented, like hypnotic cult of selfishness. I don't even know how to explain it. It's just very intense. <laughs> don't be fooled and it, by, the, and it, by the liberals. <laughs> well, yeah, and it's really funny because I feel like in my personal experience a lot of impact can make a change and it's so interesting um
it's so interesting, the cults, <laughs> the cult. And I feel like, yeah, in my experience, I run into, I just feel like I, I'm in, I'm in spaces of people who are like minds and, and then everyone else is like, not with it. And I just feel like I'm surrounded by cults or, or groups of people. Basically, what you said, Alice, saying how they're not rebelling the right, the, the right way or radical the right way. And um, so I just, it feels like one big navigation of the world, which is why I've been really thinking about like intuition or like um, what do you do when there's so much like noise, noise. I don't know if I want to describe it that, that way. Um, because there's all sorts of voices saying whatever and they're and especially on social media with the the following and the whatever um and i and then also there's so much there's so much to respond to but i think it was something else alice said or i think i it, we were talking yesterday i just pr personally feel that like um <laughs> I just don't think, I just think a lot in the art world, there's a lot of performativity. I just, I think that like with, with homeless people or, or people, there are people who, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I just feel like, and this, this might, I'm always thinking about people's feelings. I'm sorry, but this might make some people upset, but I just feel like it's like lots of middle-class artists who are commenting on like how how to change communities or whatever. And it's like, I, I wanna hear from people who are low income and who are poor and who are homeless shelters and who are in the street. I wanna hear from those people. And, um, and then it goes, but then the other side of me is like, now what happens if like, for example, you've been houseless or you've been broke? for a decade <laughs> and wrote for five years and then all of a sudden you you gain more money or you gain more resources I feel like that's a really interesting question to think about because I feel um yeah I just feel like that's something to think about um because I guess and personally I go in and out of different classes and so I struggle with um when do I feel feel good? You know, like this this experience is really shitty and really uncomfortable. Up oh, now I'm here, but now do I like feel bad? Like what do I do here? Up oh, I'm here, and I think I'm really grateful that I go in and out of classes because I think that if I didn't, I wouldn't understand. I wouldn't understand how I understand now. I'm and even though some things have been really extremely painful and bewildering I'm really grateful for, the, for those experiences or else I feel like I'd be um kind of clueless and then finally I was saying that like I really feel like a lot of people I feel like this may not be for everyone but I feel like um if you're if a person is used to safety like consistent safety and stability they might not have any idea what it's like to be on the street and not know where you're going. And so, um, or someone maybe yeah, they have a like consistent stability um, and safety. I can see why that, that person might look at someone else who's struggling and be like, you're not working hard enough. You're complaining too much. You know, you just have to take responsibility for your life, wake up earlier. And I just feel like it's that, Pers it's that personal experience that I feel can make a difference. I know it's four, but um, it's just amazing. Um, someone, ex someone experiencing X, Y, Z that could change their perspective on things. So I don't know. I kind of want to, I kind of, is it bad where I'm sort of like, I just, I just want maybe these people on wall street to, this is really bad to say, but I feel like it can be helpful if some of these people on Wall Street, this is so bad, but like if they're, they become homeless, not for a week, not for two weeks, but for a year, maybe two years, how would that change their perspective? And I would never wish that on anyone, but I think it, it, it'll, you know. 
I um, think um, on that note, um, Alice, I'm so sorry to cut you okay. off. We are just after four, and I promised everyone that four would be the hard deadline for the end of this talk, but, but maybe um, we do a part two sometime soon, because I think we uh, still have a lot of things, a lot of really, really interesting things that are coming up, um, and a lot of really good shit to talk about still. Um, so um, I guess maybe we can go for a couple more minutes if anyone wants to just like have one last thing to say, um, otherwise... Um, Okay, Alice, do you have something to end with? Um, I don't want to end it with it because it's kind of negative and bitchy, but um, it's like about what happens when millionaires become homeless because I know people who have done this and it's, uh, yeah, um, they should, I mean, maybe it helps them, but also they still know how to have power because they grew up in it. They have, the, they like will always have that socialization of like knowing how to control power and wherever they are. Um, I mean, okay, that's like very absolute. I could also maybe they do actually spiritually transform some of them. Um, but like, yeah, I think that it's just like, we have to, this is like such a great conversation and I'm so grateful for it. Like, I really feel like it answered my prayers because it's so important to talk about class. Everyone knows it and no one's talking about it. And it really does need to be spoken about. And um, in a way that's not constrained by like liberal fetishism of like pain and suffering, but like actually for, you know, people who grow, who grew up with or have experienced economic crisis, um, just saying how we feel about things and then what we think, because it's smart. It's just like, true you know like I read a lot about capitalism and I mean that's also the thing like when I was homeless I was reading Marx like straight up like I was like I'm trying I'm gonna understand why the fuck this happened to me like what the hell is going on um but uh you know uh and things like that happen all the time um and anyways I'm gonna stop because I do I also really have to go but thank you guys so much yeah, thank, thank you all so much um, for, again, just your willingness to like jump into this wild experiment with with me and with all of us. Um, I really appreciate all of you and I'm just so grateful that we got to um, do that, do the performance yesterday and to come together today and have this discussion. And absolutely, I'm down to do part two um, because I, I agree. I think we need more spaces to talk explicitly about class and about the way that these things affect us, not only as artists, but as just like human beings, um, because I think a lot of people are, are terrified to have these discussions. Um, and we need to not be so scared about it, because this is the only way that we're going to find solutions or alternatives or whatever. Um, and I think it's really important to, um, you know, say that, like, to question these things and to open up the spaces for questioning and to deepen our levels of questioning and not just be so ready to go to like the rational sort of like ready-made liberal solution to these questions. Cause that's not, it's not that easy and it's not um, that simple and not that like the edges aren't smooth, you know, it's, it's difficult and it's, and it's hard and it's sharp. Um, and we have to be ready and willing to grapple with these things. So I just really appreciate your willingness to do that and your, um, uh, presence today and and yesterday and um thank you so much to anyone who is watching or will who will watch this in the future and um be on the lookout for part two i guess so have a wonderful afternoon thank you all so much um thank you goodbye bye thank you bye, bye. thank you